Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, do you all know about <clears throat> Knowles' law of media accuracy? Uh, so this is a law that everything you read in the news is absolutely true, except for that rare story which you happen to have first-hand knowledge of. So I have some first-hand knowledge. Uh, I work at Google, like Leah said, on our open source security team, where our mission is to make uh, the software that Google and the rest of the world uh, uses in open source more secure. I also uh, was on the PSF board. My term, my three-year term there actually just ended, but that my mission there was to help make uh, one very big open source project that you're all familiar with, Python, uh, more secure as well. And I'm also a maintainer of the Python package index where I help ensure the long-term success of hundreds of tiny open source projects you might have never heard of or you might use. I'm also on the Open, software, open Source Software Security Foundation on the technical advisory committee there where I help guide the success of the next generation of open source security technologies. So it is literally my job to figure out the ways in which open source is insecure and then figure out how to fix it. And so lucky for me, there's been a lot of attention paid to this in this area recently. So I've seen so many headlines like the next supply chain attack vector is open source software. Software supply chain attacks hit 61% of all firms. The internet is on fire. And some of these headlines are Python specific as well, right? Uh, so here's a headline for you. Dozens of malicious PyPI packages discovered targeting developers. 3,500 malicious packages uploaded PyPI. Frankenstein malware stitched together from code of others disguised as a PyPI package. I don't know about you, but that kind of sounds like my software as well. <laughs> here's a headline for you. I'm kind of tired of these headlines. You might think, great, Dustin, half your job is done. Just go and fix those things that they're all talking about, but no. It's not that those headlines are wrong per se, it's just that they're sort of like declaring water is wet. Like for anyone with firsthand knowledge, this is stuff that's been known for a long time, that this is kind of possible and these things exist. And frankly, it's also been ignored for a long time. So yeah, to be honest, I'm a little tired of these headlines. I'm so tired, in fact, I'm just gonna write one headline to end all headlines, so let me just get this out of the way. Headline, Python is not secure. I'm not gonna lie, uh, it's not secure by any means, right? Anyone can publish anything they want on PyPI. Python itself doesn't have sandboxing by default. You, it can do anything that the, the user running it on the machine can do. And while Python is generally considered memory safe, it's built on C, and lots of Python libraries make use of the CFFI to call na native, potentially memory unsafe code. So really though, this isn't just limited to Python. The truth is open source is not secure. There is no perfectly secure software ecosystem. Programming language, deployment environment, cloud provider. Open source is no exception here. Some are better than others in some real ways. And yes, we have very real problems to solve still, but none of them are perfectly secure and they never will be. But overall, I think open source is pretty secure actually. And this is the premise for my talk. No matter what you hear about the insecurity of open source, it's but a small flaw in an otherwise iceberg sized secure ecosystem. And in fact, I think that many of the things we consider security issues today are not necessarily flaws, but these are trade-offs that we've made over time for things like usability, for example. So I wanna give you a bit of context about these trade-offs uh, what I think you should be worried about and what you shouldn't be worried about, and how we've continued to get better over the years, especially recently. So in this talk, overall, I wanna give you some context for security in our ecosystem. I want to help you understand the trade-offs that we've made, help you understand how we evaluate impact and how we're making progress. Generally though, this advice should be applicable to any ecosystem. This is not just specific to Python, not just specific to open source, not just limited to security either. I wanna give you an overall sense that the Python ecosystem has generally made the right decisions when it comes to security. And if you already feel that way, I want to show you how you can continue to keep that be the case. So first, understanding trade-offs. Here's the thing you need to understand about trade-offs. Everything is a trade-off. There are trade-offs in every decision and there's never just one best solution, right? Literally every engineering decision, a trade-off has been made within it. For example, bugs are a trade-off. Your code, 
probably has bugs, I'm sorry, but it's true. But it's okay, right? You wrote those bugs, maybe not intentionally, but you wrote those bugs as part of a trade-off. You could have spent 10 times, 20 times the amount of time writing the code, reviewing the code, testing the code, and yes, it probably would have had less bugs. It might not have been perfect, but still better. But instead, you took the time to add a new feature, or you got a feature out faster, or you were able to fix more issues that your users were experiencing. This is a trade-off, right? Overall, your project is probably better because it has those bugs. Another example, breaking changes. A breaking change is also a trade-off. Rather than spending time on an order, uh, an order of magnitude more time trying to get the design exactly right the first time, and let's be honest, you probably still aren't gonna get it right the first time, you got it into the hands of users faster, you got feedback faster, and hopefully you can then iterate on it. At the expense of what might be a, a rough or expensive transi transition down the road, but you still uh, got it out there. Similarly, insecurities, they're trade-offs, right? Not unlike bugs. You can devote your entire engineering budget to security, and as a result, you would have less vulnerabilities. But you wouldn't get anything done, your CEO would be upset. I think Python is a success because of the trade-offs that we've made. Python is more than 30 years old at this point. Uh, PyPI is more than 20 years old at this point, and we've made some significant trade-offs in that time. Now, this is not to say that every trade-off we made was the right trade-off. We've definitely learned lessons along the way, like how and when to do a major version bump. But overall, each of these is a trade-off that has ultimately led to Python success. So here's another headline. Python is a success, right? I think Python, we can all agree, is a successful uh, open source ecosystem. What's actually important is how we handle these trade-offs. The important thing is not whether we make it, but how we handle the issues that may arise as a result. So if you're writing mildly buggy code, but you have no system to catch, triage, fix those bugs, that's the problem, right? Similarly, in Python, we have made some trade-offs, but overall, we have good systems to handle the side effects of those trade-offs. I'll give you an example. Malware on PyPI. This is the subject of some of those headlines, right? There's lots of news about it. It happens all the time. I personally have removed thousands of malware packages from PyPI. Almost all of them were reported to us by third-party security researchers. Take my word for it. This is not a thing I enjoy doing. But also, take my word for it, I'm glad that I have to do it. Malware is a trade-off. If you look for solutions to this problem, a lot of people will say, okay, just, just block all malware on PyPI, or add some additional obstacles, make it harder to publish, take a credit card or something like that, or require a human to audit it before something can go live. So putting aside for a second whether that's even possible, is it even desirable overall, right? People complain all the time about the complexity of Python packaging, uh, and the challenges publishing to PyPI are rarely a part of that because we've put a ton of effort into making that as easy as possible. The fact that it's easy to publish some random malware package to PyPI is because it's easy for anyone to publish anything to PyPI, and that's a good thing. And this is noticeable, right? This is not me imagining this. Um, this is a, sorry, I didn't describe the previous one. The previous uh, photograph was a, a list of all the malware packages that have been removed over the years. This is a tweet saying, I finally got around to posting a package to PyPI. Geez, the comparison to CRAN process is like night and day. Zero worrying about a petty tyrant yelling at me for not following some abstruse and poorly documented procedures. So when you compare the experience of a, a maintainer on PyPI to the experience of a maintainer on other ecosystems, um, this is what you get. And it's not to say that that other ecosystem is bad, to be clear, right? They've just made a different set of trade-offs. It's easy to say the solution to malware on PyPI is to, okay, let's just block all malware. But repos like CPAN and CRAN have almost no malware on them, and as far as I'm aware, uh, this comes at the cost of significant friction for its users, right? Classifying software is really hard, especially uh, in a, a dynamic language like Python, and it's even harder at the scale of PyPI. So a false negative here means that, that malware becomes trusted. A false positive means that something legitimate, something that people might actually need is getting blocked or potentially removed in error. So as a result, you, you kind of need this human in the loop, but at PyPI scale, something like what CRAN does is, is not really feasible. But we're okay with that because we've evaluated the overall impact and decided it's actually worth it. So part two, evaluating impact. 
one of the key things to take into account when evaluating a trade-off is, is the overall impact, right? So in the example before, I said bugs are trade-offs, right? You're okay with having a few bugs in your software because overall the impact and the average bug is not that bad. And you probably have good procedures around detecting, triaging, resolving those bugs. Hopefully you also have a way to evaluate the impact of bugs and can generally limit their scope. But sometimes, maybe rarely, bugs can have an outsized impact. So here's an example, the Knight Capital bug. Knight Capital was an American financial services firm. You'll note that I say was. Uh, in, in 2012, they had 1,400 employees. They were the largest trader uh, of US equities with a market share of around 17% of the New York Stock Exchange. They managed an average daily trading volume of more than 3.3 billion trades. And that's about $21 billion a day. They were huge. Knight Capital doesn't exist anymore. In fact, Knight Capital, Knight Capital went from existing to not existing in the course of about 45 minutes. Uh, when a bug in its automated trading system caused it to purchase about $7 billion of stocks in less than an hour. The team at Knight Capital weren't even aware that this was happening. Uh, they didn't even notice it. The analysts at the New York Stock Exchange actually saw that the trading volume was more than twice the normal amounts for the, the stock exchange, determined Knight was the source, and literally called them up on the phone to let them know. If you read about the downfall of Knight Capital, and there's a lot of writing about this, I suggest you read it, especially as software engineers, there's an interesting story in there. You'll see that a lot of people are claiming that the, the bug that caused this was impossible to predict. And I think that's fair. Uh, most bugs are impossible to predict. If you have a way to predict bugs, come and talk to me after this talk, I'd like to know. However, the issue isn't that they couldn't predict the bug, right? It's that once the bug manifested itself, they didn't have a good system for handling it, which let it grow in impact. And overall, they underestimated the potential impact of bugs like this, and they had insufficient safeguards to pre prevent them. So if the bug could have been stopped or reverted within a few minutes, they probably would still exist. So this is an example where you probably should have spent a little bit more time on preventing those bugs. I think another more familiar example uh, of the importance of, of understanding impact can be found in the Python 2 to 3 migration. I mentioned before that this, this was a trade-off, right? This was a collection of improvements to Python via breaking changes that if they hadn't been done would have seriously hampered Python's ability to succeed and grow in a sustainable way. But I think we, the ecosystem at the time, I wasn't involved in this decision, I think we seriously underestimated the impact that the migration would have on Python users. I think we underestimated the amount of Python users that were using Python, right? And also the complexity of the systems they had built in Python 2 and how this would affect them. I wanna bring this back to our previous example about malware being a trade-off as well, right? Here's a question. Is malware on PyPI actually an impactful problem? And I don't mean by the number of articles written, but the number of end users adversely affected. Obviously, it would be preferable to not have any malware on PyPI at all. Dealing with malware takes up a non-trivial amount of maintainer time, and that could be used elsewhere. But in the grand scheme of things, can we work to make PyPI users more secure? Is preventing malware the most impactful thing we should focus on? So based on my experience, I would argue that it's not. It's a high occurrence, but low impact sort of thing. It happens all the time, but it doesn't actually affect the majority of users. On the other hand, something like an attacker getting access to the account of a single maintainer of a somewhat popular package uh, and making a malicious release because their password was leaked or they didn't have 2FA enabled, that would be highly impactful. And this has happened exactly once as far as I'm aware, but I would estimate that the number of users affected exceeds that of all users affected by some random malware published on PyPI in the last year combined. Okay, part three, making progress. So just because you've made a trade-off and you've measured the impact doesn't absolve you from continuing to try and make progress against that which you've traded off against. So I wanna share some substantial and significant progress that the Python community has made towards increased open source security uh, in, in the vein of making progress towards these goals. So last year you might have heard that we gave away a few thousand two-factor authentication security keys to select critical projects on PyPI. In May this year, we actually announced that every account that maintains any project or organization on PyPI will be required to enable two-factor authentication on their account by the end of 2023. 
In June, we required anyone with two-factor authentication enabled to upload via API tokens. And in August, we required two-factor authentication for any new account on PyPI. This is progress. By the end of this year, we will require that all accounts publishing code to PyPI have 2FA enabled. And why? Why did we do this? We took a look at the number of users that were vulnerable to password leaks, phishing attacks, the number of users that would be affected if just a small number of those accounts were compromised. And we decided that the trade-off, specifically the work we have to do to implement this, support this, as well as the work each maintainer has to do to adopt two-factor authentication if they haven't already, is totally worth it. Because the alternative is that we, the maintainers, waste a lot of time responding to what amounts to a very preventable class of attacks. We also announced something called trusted publishing. This is a new way for maintainers to publish from PyPI, uh, publish to PyPI from hosted services like uh, GitHub Actions. And that doesn't require long-lived passwords or API tokens. And this is something that requires maintainers to make a change. They have to adopt this. But we put a lot of effort into minimizing how much churn is necessary. So if you're already using the Python Package Authority's GitHub Actions workflow to publish, uh, this is almost entirely abstracted away. It's a small couple line change to your workflow mostly about removing this, the secret from your workflow. This is progress, why? Why did we do this? We looked at the impact of the leak credentials across hosted providers and the frequency that such leaks in the past uh, occurred, and we found this is a good way to prevent leaks of credentials entirely. So in terms of trade-offs, there isn't as much downside, aside from implementation effort. Uh, but there are other add-on benefits as well, right? We Trusted publishing gives us a nice verified link between Upstream, upstream source repository that's publishing an artifact on PyPI that we never had before. So we have additional trust here as well. We also created the uh, Python Packaging Advisory Database, which is a community-owned collection of all vulnerabilities in Python packages. We serve these up via an API on PyPI, and we created a tool called pip audit that audits requirements files, lock files, virtual environments for vulnerable versions. Uh, and this includes functionality to automatically fix those respective things as well. Last month, we, oh, that's a slide early. Uh, why, why did we do this? The impact of vulnerabilities in packages on PyPI could be potentially high. Vulnerability auditing will always come with these trade-offs. It takes work to review audits and take action on them as necessary. But overall, providing these tools make it easier to find and fix vulnerabilities. Last month, we announced that the Python Software Foundation had become a, a CNA, a CVE numbering authority. This has lots of benefits, but overall, this helps ensure that the advisories being published about Python and related packages are meaningful and actionable to end users. In June, the PSF also announced the hire of our first security developer in residence, Seth Michael Larson. And not to be outdone, in August, PyPI hired a full-time safety and security engineer, Mike Fiedler. So there have been lots of people over the years who've contributed security at the PSF, and no one was paid to do it and had it in their job title. And there are obvious trade-offs here, right? The money that is spent to pay their salaries could go into PSF infrastructure or grants for global conferences, et cetera. But the impact so far has been really great. Seth has led the creation of that PSF as a CNA. Mike has been leading a new project, the launch of the PyPI Malware Reporting and Response Project. So this is just to bring it all full circle and back to malware. So even though we've made this trade-off where we think uh, a little bit of malware is okay on PyPI at the expense of having people being able to publish there, and that the impact is low, we're still working to make this better, right? Right now, PyPI receives malware reports from third-party researchers, mostly via email, and responding to these, triaging these, handling duplicates, and taking action can be really time-consuming. So we're building an API for reporters and a lot of infrastructure around how admins triage and remove malware. We're still a little early in this project to say that we've made a lot of progress, but Mike just published a blog post yesterday looking at some of the key metrics around the volume of malware reports we receive with a ton of details. And one of the findings is that even though we haven't officially even started the project yet, response times to malware reports have already dropped over the last six months. So currently 80% of reports are responded within 60 minutes and 100% are responded within 12 hours. And this is due to a small mix of process improvements additional bandwidth and that kind of thing. Strongly suggest uh, taking a look at the post for more details if you're interested. So one last thing I wanna say about progress. Uh, I just showed you a slice of the Python ecosystem, but this is playing a 
out across the entire open source ecosystem. And ultimately, all these communities exist because we trust each other. Part of that trust is that we can share code with each other, and it will not do surprising things like erase our hard drive. But part of that trust exists because there are expectations. Expectations that, uh, expectations like taking reasonable security measures to keep your users safe. You put your trust in me to make the right trade-offs, and likewise, I put that same trust in you. I want to say thanks to the organizers and conference staff for inviting me to join you at the conference. Thanks to the Open Source Security Foundation for funding the Python Security Developer in Residence role. Thanks to AWS as well for funding the PyPI Safety and Security Engineer role. Uh, thanks to my team at Google for funding security keys and pip audit, trusted publishing, and much more. Shout out to everyone who has already enabled 2FA on PyPI. Make sure you do that by the end of the year. And thanks to you all for listening. <laughs>